What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, it is awesome seeing uh, a bunch of the conversations already happening down in the chat. Um, as most of you are aware, uh, we do have a stream scheduled uh, to go live uh, on Tuesday the 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so for anyone looking at that, I have nothing I can talk about, uh, nothing that we can, uh, discuss here. So if you're going to want to, uh, hear about what's that, what that announcement's about, uh, and what's going on there, uh, be sure to either follow the link that I just dropped down into the chat, uh, subscribe to the Lumix, uh, USA channel if you're watching it right now, uh, and get all your notifications on for that. Um, I just want to kind of get that out of the way at the beginning. Um, I cannot and will not be discussing anything about that, uh, as some people have pointed out in the uh, in the chat already. So, um, yeah. But this week, we wanted to uh, kind of just take the time and talk about the technologies and some of the unique features that the Lumix lenses offer uh, when you're looking at both the Micro Four Thirds and the L-mount system of lenses. Uh, I had originally planned to use a 10 to 25 uh, to demo this out to everybody, but unfortunately I do not have my sample with me, so uh, I'm going to end up using some of the S-series lenses, but the vast majority of the technology that uh, you know we're kind of going to be discussing here in this, this open kind of flow of a stream uh, is going to be relevant for both the S-series and the G-series cameras. So don't think that just because I'm talking about S-series primarily or using them for the demonstration, uh, that that means that a G-series lens doesn't have uh, some of the same design goals and capabilities and, and just performances. So uh, if this is the first time that you've joined us for Lumix Live, uh, welcome. Uh, these are the weekly broadcasts that we do uh, here on YouTube, and uh, I'm hoping we can start expanding this out to some other platforms as well uh, through multi-streaming and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, these are the conversations we have about tech, about the art of our jobs and our careers, so photography, videography, cinematography. Uh, and, you know, every once in a while we'll have guests on to talk with them about their particular style, their particular job, you know, they, that kind of conversation. And uh, ultimately, the main goal with these is to allow all of you to have a direct contact in with Panasonic and ask us questions. Uh, I know that there are burning questions out there across the board for pretty much every type of uh, shooter that's out there. Uh, and we just want to be a resource for all of you to be able to have an opportunity to reach out, get your questions asked, uh, and we'll always try to get to as many of them as we can during the streams. Uh, but know that if we don't happen to get to your question during the stream, uh, it does inform us what future streams should be covering. In fact, today's stream came out of a lot of the conversations that we have been seeing and getting questions about over the last couple of months uh, about lenses. You know, what, what makes the Lumix series of lenses and the G-series lenses, you know, so different compared to some of the others that are out there? Uh, what kind of things are we doing to our optics uh, that set them apart from everything else? So, uh, if you have a question, as you can see, some people have been doing already in the chat. Make sure to tag at Lumix cameras. So type the at symbol and then start typing Lumix. Uh, and that will pop up on my screen so that I can see it and actually be able to answer your questions. Uh, if I don't see that, it's very hard for me to actually be able to see your question. Uh, so it's a little uh, little tough to, to get that kind of stuff. Um, outside of that, uh, I see a lot of people dropping in the chat where, where y'all are joining us from. So that is awesome to, uh, to, to see. So uh, if you guys want to keep doing that, it's always cool to see, you know, where everyone's actually jumping in from. Um, we love seeing that kind of stuff. Um, before we go too far into this, I want to remind everybody about the Lumix Pro services uh, service that we have in the U.S. and many other countries as well. The link here is for the U.S. Uh, division or the U.S. group for Lumix Pro services. We have two tiers in the U.S. We have Red and Platinum. Red is the free tier that uh, everybody is pretty much everybody's eligible for. Uh, go over there, take a look, you can follow the QR code or go to lumix-pro.com. Um, get yourself registered. It gets you that three-year warranty when you have new purchases. Um, it's a much more smooth, streamlined process if you happen to need service while you are out in the field and shooting. 
Then we have our Platinum Membership, which is really designed more for uh, those that want the ultimate best coverage that you can get on your equipment from a manufacturer. So you still get that three-year warranty uh, that we provide with our equipment, but some of the added benefits is that you get faster excuse me, you get faster turnaround times if you do have to send your equipment in for repair. You get 20% off out of warranty repairs, so things like drops, breaks, stuff like that, where things actually need to be replaced and it's not a defect. Uh, you get a really cool welcome kit with a really nice custom design, peak design strap in there. Uh, and you're eligible for uh, annual sensor cleanings, calibrations, firmware updates, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's really just a, a solid platform for situations where you really need your equipment to, uh, to you know, kind of do its best uh, in situations where you may have a problem with something. Uh, you also get an exclusive member direct phone number into our service team, so uh, it makes it a lot easier to get in touch with us uh, through the phone if you happen to need to reach out to anybody. So before we jump in, let's see what kind of questions we got to see uh, if I need to change any of what I've already got kind of scheduled, because we all know how these live events uh, go every once in a while. Sometimes we get a whole bunch of questions that actually kind of divert some of the conversation. So uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, Ruckus is asking, does the Lumix S5 allow you to photograph in APS-C mode like you can in video mode? Uh, yes and no. It lets you do it. Uh, the S-series cameras do let you photograph in APS-C mode if you're using something, a smart adapter that's telling the camera that you're using an APS-C lens. Uh, there is not a manual... Uh, selector to drop into a Super 35 or an APS-C crop. Uh, but good feedback. Um, let's see here. Uh, Ruckus also asks, uh, for the S-Series line of cameras, would uh, would you know if it is possible for us to take custom white balance using a Lumix app without having to do it in the physical camera? Um, not in the way that you can do it on the camera. Um, I know that that is one of the things that a couple of us have uh, brought up as we're expanding and evolving the Lumix Sync app. Uh, as of right now, if you want to do the custom white balance targeting, which I can show people if you haven't done it before, it's a really cool direct way to do this. Um, yeah, as of right now, you have to do that in camera uh, for it. Or if you're on something like the, the box camera, you have to do that. Uh, you can do it in the uh, multicam software excuse me, software. Uh, actually, you can do that with any of the uh, Lumix Tether compatible cameras. Uh, let's see here. Uh, doctor's asking, if Lumix decides to upgrade their autofocus from DFD to something else, uh, are lenses, would lenses be compatible? Uh, unfortunately, I can't comment on autofocus stuff um, in general, but what something to remember when it comes to the way autofocus technologies work when it's when you're talking about lenses lens design is about the motors and we are actually going to be talking about the motors and why we use the particular ones that we do for capture um it's safe to say that the motors and the build of an autofocus system for or in a lens for what we're implementing with our cameras has to be able to function at much faster rates than uh, other forms of autofocus uh, as and they have to be able to perform a lot quieter than others so we'll we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes uh, what I mean by all of the different technologies there uh, Basil's asking, uh, what bit depth does the G100 use for stills? I know video is 8-bit. Um, yes, so video is 8-bit. Uh, G100 stills, I believe, are 12-bit? They might be 10-bit? No, uh, I believe they're 12-bit. Uh, I will get an answer uh, throughout this stream for you, but I'm pretty sure it's 12-bit. Um, the modern cameras like the GH5S and the entire S-series cameras can shoot 14-bit raw. Um I think the G100 is a 10-bit camera, or a tw sorry, it's a 12-bit camera, whether or not you're shooting in electronic shutter or uh, mechanical. So there, there isn't a change there. Uh, Bob's asking, new roadmap on lenses? I don't have anything about that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, yeah, I, just, just, I just don't have any other uh, info on, on lenses like that. Uh, for you. I know everyone's waiting for the rest of the f1.8 series lenses. Um, I know, believe me, I'm waiting too. Uh, it will be really cool uh, when we can get the rest of those out. Um, but 
I would uh, I I would encourage everyone just to to look at the 85 millimeter. Uh, we we did talk about you know the 35, 24, and 50 millimeter that will be coming, um, and uh, the design goals behind them and and what that series is going to be you know kind of targeting to do. So um, take a look at the 85. Uh, I know that may not be everyone's focal length of choice. Uh, personally, I love 85 millimeter. Uh, but it'll give you a good idea of what, what you should expect for uh, the other series lenses that are coming out. Obviously, different focal lengths, but yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, hi from the rainy UK. Well, hello from a rainy Austin, Texas. Uh, are we going to get a slow super zoom for the L mount? Perhaps not as crazy as the 14 to 140 for Micro Four Thirds. Would be a nice thought. Sorry for repost added the tag. Oh, okay. Um, so... I don't have any information on additional lenses outside of the the lenses that we have announced that we are developing and, and will have coming out soon. Um, super zoom lens on L mount. Uh, I imagine look, since you're referencing the 14 to 140 in full frame terminology, a lot of times what you see is is the typical 24 to 105. Some will do say like a 24 to 120. Um, you start to run into, I think, at, at, at least when you start looking at optic designs, you start running into either, is it going to be ultra slow, uh, slow in the fact of aperture, uh, or what the priority is uh, at the time of a launch. Um, that's one of the nice things about the L-Mount Alliance, is that you have like our beautiful 24 to 105 that's available, and then you also have options from Sigma as well. Uh, that are more and more coming out in a native L mount version, not the um, kind of converted lenses like uh, my 24 millimeter here, uh, which is actually my 24 millimeter. Um, tell you, you know, when when we talk, like people like Matt Frazier and I talk about this kind of stuff, um, you can rest assured that we actually do shoot with this equipment. Uh, Matt photographs uh, his kids' basketball. I photograph my dog and landscapes and uh, astrophotography stuff like that. So a lot of times we actually own some of the equipment that we're using instead of uh, the brands, uh, you know, Panasonic giving us this stuff. So we have skin in the game too. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so as far as a, a long, uh, you know, kind of super zoom lens, I we, we always take comments like this when we bring it up. We uh, pose it to the engineers and see if it's something that would fit into a roadmap. And uh, yeah, um, as soon as we know anything typically is when you guys know. Uh, this stuff as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, Basil. All right. I, I answered that question with the G100, so it should be 12 bit, but I will get confirmation for you. Uh, Alan's asking, I have the S20 to 60 millimeter and I find it soft in the corners, even stop down. Uh, it's good point. Uh, it's good point is lightness of coupled with the S5. What lens would you recommend in place of the 20 to 60? Um, so as far as a 20 to 60 millimeter, it is it is genuinely an incredibly unique focal length for um, full frame cameras. And for those that don't know which uh, lens uh, Alan's talking about here, this is the uh, 20 to 60 millimeter that came out with the, and of course that's not going to work. Um, this is the 20 millimeter that came out with the uh, S5. So. Uh, very unique focal length. It's designed to be, you know, much wider than our typical uh, focal lengths. Um, and, you know, knowing that it's not a Lumix uh, S Pro series lens, S Pro would be our um, uh, Leica uh, co-design lenses, that kind of thing. Uh, you could look at the 24 to 105 uh, if you want maybe a little bit more reach, but you have to remember that you're going to give up that wide angle. Um, so typically going from 20 to 60, if you're looking for something that's a step up from that lens, you end up starting to split your optics into two uh, different lenses for different ranges because you're going to get a better result when you split lenses out. Uh, when they don't have to do as much work to cover as long of a range, you typically are going to get a better lens uh, produced out of it. Uh, if you're looking at things like uh, resolution charts and stuff like that. A lot of times uh, I still shoot with uh, a lot of M-mount glass. Uh, so like an M-mount just put onto my uh, S1R. And uh, it, sure, they may not be the best resolving lenses out there, but they have just such a great look to them. Uh, and 
ultimately it's a matter of are we going to be shooting charts or are we going to be shooting customers or photographing customers poor choice of words uh if we're going to be shoot uh, photographing clients and customers things like that or landscapes um there is so much about lenses that transcend beyond just a lab test you can you can objectively measure lenses but then there's the major subjective choice i mean uh, interacting with a lot of uh, with a lot of you guys here in the chat, I know that a lot of people love mounting old series lenses on modern cameras because they gave a character or a style or a certain look to them that you're really looking for. And at that point, I'd say you know just look at which one works best uh, for your particular look that you're going after. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's three more questions posted here before we jump on to the actual full. Uh, um, kind of stuff here. Uh, where's the other one? I uh, would love to see a set of custom white balance in the S5. Okay, Ruckus would love to see how to set the custom white balance in the S5. Uh, cool. I will uh, actually show you that on the um, S1H here that I'm going to use for the lens demos uh, to show you. It's going to be the same exact uh, way to do it. So uh, that's perfect. Yes, and I and I actually have my gray card with me. Um, so yeah, we'll do that. Uh, let's see here. Um, any plans to allow users to reverse on the screen distance scale when focusing manually? It seems like it's a simple addition that I would love to see happen. Uh, and that comes from Nelson Images. I think I know what you're meaning. Um, so the the kind of never-ending uh, conversation that happens online between the direction that you use to go from near to far, uh, whether you're in Camp A or Camp B, um, I don't know if there's a plan to do that. I don't know. I truthfully, I don't know how difficult that would be, uh, as far as a programming wise, it's easy to say that it looks like it should be easy, um, for, for engineers to, to rewrite code and have it do it. Uh, but it is something that, that, you know, comments like this, we do bring up to our engineers and to our, uh, our planning teams and, uh, we let them know. And every once in a while, actually a lot of times they're watching these streams as well. So the things that you guys are commenting and, uh, letting us know that you want to see does get brought over uh, and, and does get seen by a number of our team in uh, Japan. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Basil's also asking, I heard that the Lumix Leica lenses somehow have some kind of special color features that only works with Lumix cameras. Is that accurate? And can you say more about it? Uh, I am going to go into a little bit of detail about, you know, what what differentiates our lines? Uh, almost every camera manufacturer typically has different tiers of optics available, right? Uh, for us, our top tier in micro four thirds are the Panasonic Leica lenses. Uh, so things like our eight to eighteen, our twelve millimeter one four that I film this uh, that I film here on the BGH one, uh, even things like our fifteen millimeter. Uh, they're co-designed and co-developed under the Leica badging. Uh, and then we also have the S Pro series in uh, the S series cameras, which are marked and actually set up as certified by Leica. So I'm going to cover a little bit about what that means uh, in in the different tiers. Um, and then obviously we have our Lumix S series lenses, which typically have a gray badge on them. Uh, so if you look at like the 20 to 60, it's got a gray S on it means that it's a Lumix S series lens. The Pro series lenses will have a red badge, like on, there it is, like on this one here. So we have that S series there. Uh, that's your indication, that's one of your indications that you're in a top tier lens. So I, I am gonna cover that in a minute. Uh, FC's asking, what kind of anamorphic lenses used during Super Bowl halftime show? The lens flares are vertical instead of horizontal. Uh, that I don't know. Uh, a lot of times it, that it's possible that that was just anamorphic like adapters put on there. Um, but I'm, I'm honestly not familiar with, uh, what, what would have been shot there. Uh, a lot of stuff for broadcast television isn't shot with typically these kinds of cameras. Um, if they are, it's usually the pre-filmed, uh, parts. Uh, and in cases like that, you may find that like they might be adding effects in post uh, because anamorphic flares are going to be horizontal. You can get vertical flares, but that usually involves adding something extra to create a vertical flare. Um, JC's asking, do all micro four thirds lenses provide rev 
provide resolving and sharpening uh, sharpness for 4K films to be produced in a theater or festival. Uh, yes, they do. A hundred percent, they do. Uh, so that's that's definitely not not something to worry about. I know there were some questions up earlier that uh, was asking about resolution and things like that for uh, lens design. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that with, uh, refer uh, we're going to be referencing one of the third party, uh, lens, uh, review sites. Um, we don't have, at least I don't have, um, right now the actual figures of, you know, what, what the resol what the resolving power of a lens is, uh, what, what we do have is that the lenses that are out are designed to resolve more than the resolution that we have in cameras to date. Uh, especially in the L mount system. So especially in the S series cameras. So um, save for a handful of lenses that would have been produced, man, at this point, uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, no, maybe a little less than that. Maybe like 18, 19 years ago. Uh, so when Lumix first came out with its interchangeable lens camera system, uh, short of a couple of lenses that are super early like that, uh, you're not going to have a problem with 4K. Uh, I mean, even on a GH5 that's doing, uh, you know, shooting open gate, uh, which is roughly five, was it 5.9K or something like that? Or it's close to, I think it's 5K high. It's a 6K worth of resolution. Um, the lenses are perfectly fine for that. Uh, and they'll resolve more than what that, the 20 megapixel sensors are out for. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Rugga says, I noticed that you have what I think is a shoulder strap for the camera, but is on the bottom of the camera. Why so? Uh, is it more secure than have the camera on the bottom? Um, oh, this part, I think Ruckus, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, this lug right here that I have, this is one of the peak design, uh, uh, clip pieces here. Uh, I have it mounted on this L bracket piece for my S1H because I constantly will take the battery grip off or on. It just depends on what I'm doing with the camera. So by mounting it to my strap lug here or mounting the strap to the bottom of the L bracket means that I can just change these out without having to undo it on here. I, technically, yeah, it can be maybe a little more secure, I guess. Just kind of depends. Uh, it also depends on how you want your camera to, to sit on your shoulder. Do you want it sitting where it's level or do you want it kind of angled? Uh, I prefer to have my camera down so that when I put my hand down, the grip is kind of closer to where my hand's going to be. So it's just easier muscle memory. Uh, so that's going to change uh, from everybody's different shooting style. Uh, all right, last question before I jump on to this camera view here. Uh, any update on when we can expect a fast 2.8 wide-angle zoom? Uh, unfortunately, I have no update for you. Um, we have the 16-35 f4. Uh, there is a 14-24 2.8 from uh, Sigma for the L-mount uh, system that's available right now. Uh, so there's definitely for the L-mount system, there are ultra-wide, or not really ultra-wide, there are very wide-angle uh, fat, fast lenses, um, available. So with that, let's, uh, let's take a look at my, uh, S1H here. So one of the first things that we, we wanted to, or that, that I wanted to talk about here is, um, a lot of times when you start looking at lenses that are available, uh, on the market, you have, Certain things that from a video perspective, so which I gather a vast majority of, of you guys joining us here are more video oriented than photography. If I'm wrong, I would love to be called out if I'm wrong on that. But um, when it comes to looking at photographic lenses, typically there are parts of the way the lenses are designed that aren't necessarily thought about when it comes to framing uh, and just the way the optic elements move together. Uh, and this typically will show up in what's called focus breathing. Now, if you've never seen focus breathing in a lens before, there are plenty of examples online of typically 70 to 200 millimeter lenses really exhibiting this fairly hard, where what happens is as you focus from your near frame to your far inf in, uh, infinity point, 
the field of view is actually changing in the lens. And in some cases, it can be a, a significant change in field of view. So what basically um, happens is because video has become more and more and more important in hybrid cameras with, you know, when we first released mirrorless cameras, it was the big push for hybrid. Uh, when we really got into, you know, the GH2 era and then the GH3 and 4 and 5. These cameras brought about the need to have photographic lenses that were fairly similar to what you would be able to expect from cinema class lenses, which as one of the reasons why they're way more expensive is that they're very well controlled for focused breathing. Uh, you run into things like called uh, parfocal uh, behavior in the way the lens is designed. So there's so much just in the different optic designs and how, they, how they're deployed in the modern lenses. So when we set out with the S-series cameras, so with the S1, S1R, and S1H, and now with the S5, one of the things that we knew was going to be critical with these cameras is the video performance. And that meant that our lenses had to be up to the same kind of, excuse me, same kind of standard. So when you look at something like this lens, this is the 50 millimeter F1.8 or F1.4 Pro lens. See, all this talk about the, the other lenses always gets me screwed up. So this is our 50 millimeter F1.4 S Pro. So this is the, the iconic, you know, kind of benchmark lens that's being used uh, for a lot of people. Uh, this lens is designed while being a photo oriented lens. So that means the chassis, the, the housing of the lens, just the, the overall design of it is designed to also keep the videography side of this very much in a professional sense. So what that means is that if I take this lens and I start looking at stuff like the focus breathing characteristics, so how much does this field of view change uh, as as I'm focusing from near to far? And I'm going to turn the, uh, the kind of border off here so you guys can see it a little bit better. But if you look at, say, you'll see right now on the right-hand side of the screen, we see multi-streaming custom RTMP Lumix. So what happens is as you focus you would see your actual depth of field massively, or not depth of field, your actual framing change a whole lot. And where you'll see this come into play with uh, typically much longer lenses is that you could be going to the point where if I start zooming or start focusing, going from say all the way out to infinity here, if I'm all the way out at infinity and then I start punching in, by zooming in, or not zooming in, by focusing closer, you could pretty much be able to actually see the distance from right here where it says Lumix. You'll see maybe a little bit of that movement into the U next to it. But traditional photo lenses, you would see the entire word next to it in some cases because that's how much your field of view shifts while you're using some non cinema style oriented lenses. Uh, and as someone just pointed out there, there are other, you know, kind of less expensive uh, cine style lenses that have a fairly decent control on focus breathing. So you're not going to see a crazy amount of focus breathing, but you're still going to see some of it. Uh, to be truly designed to not have focus breathing, you're still going to have to go up to really higher end cinema series glass. Uh, and at that point, you're getting some additional features. You're getting, you know, things like the actual focus gears put on the different uh, controls for this, uh, for the lens. Uh, but our goal is to make sure that a lens like this can still be used in the same way that you would use a cinema lens. So that focus breathing is something that is, is very much front and center in the optic design. And we don't just carry this logic onto the S Pro series lenses. Lenses like our 24 to 105. It's it's an S series lens. It's a it's a, it's an S category lens, so it's not an S Pro, but it still is designed to mitigate a huge portion of focus breathing that you would typically be seeing of other conventional lenses on the market. So this allows that that much nicer control, that better look. 
um, if you've seen, you know, kind of very dramatic focus pulls in major cinema, you just get such a different feel when you know that as you zoom or as you focus and you're going from, say, the background to your subject, you know that it's just going to have that more natural look instead of seeing this kind of shrinking or enlarging of your subject as they move in and out of the focal point. So one of the other kind of additional things that that is added in with the modern lenses that we have is our uh, ability to okay ruckus i'm gonna i'm gonna answer that question next actually all right so one of the other uh, kind of big advantages with the lumix uh with the lumix lenses right now uh and our is why i wanted to use the 10 to 25 to show this not just the s series lenses is Lumix lenses have also been designed with our, basically we have our focus ring here, we have our zoom ring here, but under the manual focus ring, we have the ability to pull the clutch back and then now get your measured distance scale here. So this is a more manual way to actually be able to program in and say, hey, I want to be able to measure out my focus distance on my lens by using, you know, kind of the older way that we would do this literally with like tape measuring out, say, I need to focus at 10 feet. Well, you now have that built into this lens and something like our 50 millimeter to be able to just pull the clutch back, see where that mark is. You know that it's measured and calibrated so that when you're, when you're physically put the, the dial at that particular distance, that's the distance that it's calibrated to focus out to. So this makes it super easy for measuring focus poles when you may not necessarily have the, the general system set up or a, a separate focus puller to be able to measure a repeatable throw. And kind of expanding on that is one of the other features that we're going to talk about in the camera. But before I do that, I want to just quickly readdress uh, Rux's question here. For someone who is new, uh, what are the differences between the gray S and the red S lenses? Better sharpness, question mark? So when we look at the S series lenses uh, for L mount, uh, the S series lenses are designed basically in two categories. You have the Lumix S lenses, which are gray badged. These are lenses that are designed to our standards, to our quality, to our sharpness spec. Uh, which I don't have those specs to share out, uh, but they're they're designed to our benchmark of quality. Then you look at the S Pro series, which is the red badge lenses. Those lenses are designed in collaboration to meet Leica's specifications for sharpness, uh, for color rendering, for even things as much as like distortion characteristics. So when you look at an S Pro lens, that is the top of the top for what you're going to find from Lumix in the L-mount system, so in our S cameras. So just like I said, it's kind of, you know, you're going to get, theoretically, you have better sharpness, though the Lumix S standard, the one that we rate our the Lumix S lenses to, is still right up there. I mean, if, if we've got the standard for the highest quality lens for our S Pro series, we've got the standard for the other lenses as well. Um, but you, you may see a little bit of a difference in color rendering, uh, since color rendering can be very heavily influenced by the lenses that you're using. Uh, we go back to that conversation at the beginning about how a lot of people love to pick up old you know, FD mount lenses or old L mount lenses and adapt them over because you like the look and the feel you get of that lens. Same thing happens with modern lenses. Your top tier, highest performing lenses and, and cameras typically have what I would call a little bit of extra, you know, kind of special sauce in there about it, in, in the design. It's, you know, it's the difference of going between, you know, clinically sharpness or, or uh, to have clinical sharpness versus having amazing sharpness with a little bit more of the brand character coming through or the the design intent for that particular optic. Uh, let's see, what's the next question? Um, which camera and lenses, this comes from uh, Shan. 
Which camera and lenses are you using for the stream? AF performance was great when you had it placed lens in front of it. Uh, this is the BGH-1 and a 12mm 1.4 Sumalux. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's what we're using. Uh, it's what I've been using for a very long time. Uh, Douglas Anderson, uh, Lumix cameras. I'm a long-time film shooter. Moved to Lumix last year from 10 years of full frame, and my focus is on stills, not video. You referenced your your presumed I'm in the major- in the majority. Survey us. Uh, I would love, you know, kind of a, 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 a an off the wall here survey. Shout out in the chat if you are primarily photo or if you are primarily video. Uh, or even if you're now in like hybrid, which would be like that middle of the road. I always love seeing and being proven wrong. Um, as someone who's primarily a photographer myself that just happened to have to move into video production, obviously with Lumix Live and everything here, uh, and as changing into basically managing and doing a lot of our internal trainings for staff, uh, it's amazing to see how everyone has kind of grown. Uh, if, if you're a photographer, shout out in the chat. If you're a videographer, shout out in the chat. I would love to see that kind of thing. That is, that is awesome to, to see. So that's, that's a little bit of a segue there. All right. Uh, cool. People already putting in there. Um, so where was I? Yes. Uh, we were talking about, oh yeah, the, um, the AS, AF performance. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're using the, the BGH one box camera. Uh, with the 12 millimeter Sumalux, and yeah, that's how I'm able to do stuff like this. Get myself all set up. Uh, and if you haven't seen what my setup is uh, for doing these kinds of things, doing these kinds of broadcasts, setting everything up, uh, take a look at our uh, upping your uh, live streaming game uh, stream that we did last week. I'll link to it uh, in the chat here uh, while we're doing some other stuff. Uh, so you guys can take a look because I actually, in that one, I actually am showing like the computer I'm editing on the, the setup I have here, what lights I use. Um, ultimately the truth is whenever you're looking at creating content, as most of you all know, lighting can be key. The better lighting you have, the better control of an environment you have, especially for this kind of stuff, the better you can make your end product look. And yeah, it's just worked out great. Awesome seeing everyone out here. More landscape photographers. That's awesome. Weekend videographers. I love seeing this. Uh, Rugga says, uh, do you have face detect autofocus? Uh, I assume you're asking if I have face detect on this. No. Um, I move a whole lot. And I personally, this is really just more a carryover of just how I've always shot. Uh, I use just the one area point and the box is about this big, uh, right? Kind of about in this area. Um, and yeah, I think the AF system on my BGH one is just set at default, just how it comes out. So that's, I think what set one, no set one is for photo. Uh, it's just the default settings that the camera comes in. Uh, and we shoot it about F2 on this one. Uh, so a little bit more depth of field. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, video from Dave, uh, no weddings ever. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, man, this is, see, this is so cool. Seeing, seeing how vastly different everyone's, you know, kind of reaction, uh, responses are here. Uh, moving more hybrid now I'm seeing here, which is awesome. Only photo from Bob. Primarily photo, but still learning and doing more video over the last year or two. Yeah, definitely Nelson. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, um, as we move on to kind of the, the next point, um, this is one that's kind of hard to to demo in my current studio. Uh, after next week's streams, so remember, we have the stream on the 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern time, so you're definitely going to want to make sure that you uh, subscribe and hit the like button, all that kind of fun stuff, uh, to make sure you don't miss that. We will have another stream next Thursday, but after that, I'm moving into a uh, another uh, apartment that's going to have a very dedicated space for the studio. So I'll be able to demonstrate some of this stuff a little bit uh, easier. So I, I have to revert to maybe a little bit of a different way to do this uh, and actually show you a piece that it's not a video piece. I'm just going to show you a website uh, because we have a ton of resources available for people that do actually want to dig in and read more about, you know, what we actually do technology wise for the lenses and, and the, the theory behind why things are, are designed the way they are. So we're looking right now 
on the uh, Panasonic North America site, so this is na.panasonic.com, and I'm going to drop this uh, into the chat so you guys can take a look at this. Uh, we have a bunch of, uh, well, currently, we have a bunch of case studies that have been written about you know using Lumix cameras in professional environments and some of the cool technologies that we've done. Uh, this one particularly right here was worked on by Matt Frazier, so y'all know Matt Frazier. Uh, so he spent a lot of time working on this one, and it basically kind of is explaining some of the stuff that we're talking about here. So when you talk about uh, lenses being parf uh, lens breathing in this case, you'll see that you've got you know kind of that that better visualization that I can give here to show you that focus shifting here to see how much an image changes in here versus how much an image changes here between you know focusing from near to far. So you've got a really cool kind of quick demo to see side by side how that actually is affected and what, what it actually looks like. And then we have that clutch demonstration here, which I just showed everybody. So we have that clutch. But some people were asking about the uh, focus motors before. Because uh, I, I remember I'm trying to remember exactly who asked that question. Uh, I apologize if I don't remember exactly who, who you were that asked that question. There's a lot of people uh, asking questions here. But uh, when you look at the different motors that get designed and are used in lenses for camera development uh, or for lens development, uh, there's a few different styles that are out there. Um, you look at either linear motors or ultrasonic motors. Um, and this is not saying, you know, good or bad things about anything. Um, about, you know, each, each company designs lenses and use, uses different parts for their particular system, and it's just how they work. Uh, but with Panasonic, we decided to move in and start using um, linear motors for a vast majority of the lenses that we have. When you're looking at something like the 50mm f1.4 S Pro, this actually uses a combination. This has linear end stepping motors. Uh, built into this because when you're working with much heavier, larger glass, you need to be able to move focus elements as fast as you possibly can, but more importantly, as accurately as you can. So we started using uh, linear focus motors a, a while ago uh, in our lenses. And if you've ever looked at some of the earlier uh, Lumix Micro Four Thirds lenses, you may have seen the little HD icon uh, imprinted on those lenses. And a lot of times what that HD icon meant back in the day was that it was a lens designed for video. So basically it had that, that more, I hate the word future proof, but the more forward thinking design to say, Hey, video is an important part of this. Lenses make noise when they focus. We need to find a way to minimize that and give you faster, more accurate filming uh, without the added noise and distraction that a focus motor can cause. Because if any of you have shot with lenses from early 2000s and older that were autofocus, the things were like grinders with how loud some of them uh, could be. So um, the linear motors basically really kind of pushed to, to allow us to focus much faster as far as moving elements, uh, the, the focus groups in the lenses, but it meant that they could be more accurate and they're incredibly quiet by comparison to the older, you know, kind of ultrasonic or some of the other uh, different technologies that are used. And every brand has different names for what they want to call their, their focus motor technology. Um, but as a side benefit of moving in with these linear focus motors meant that we were also able to do some other very kind of challenging uh, technologies that you typically will never see in a photo oriented lens. And it's even not that common in, in mid to, well, mid to high ish range, uh, kind of more cinema oriented lenses. And that's, what's called being parfocal. So parfocal, uh, for those that don't know, means that if you are someone who likes to use, say your 70 to 200, you zoom into 200 millimeter, you set your focus, and then you zoom out to 70 millimeter because that's where you want to frame it. Traditional lenses have a different focus point when you're zooming through the range. So at 200 millimeter, 
what is in focus and what you're actually setting the cams to when you're focusing is going to be different than what it would be at 70 millimeter in a conventional lens in a very traditional design lens. When you look at the kind of next evolution of that, it was parfocal, which meant that you could zoom out to say 200 millimeter, focus on your subject. And when you would manually zoom the lens back, your focus does not shift. So that, that focus plane stays where you set it originally. Now, as we started creating more and more, you know, modernized lenses that are designed for video and still shooters, and knowing that the increased demand of higher end productions wanting to start using cameras like this, but needing them to be able to work the way they would expect them to work, uh, as if they were using cinema lenses, we designed in the S series cameras and some of the uh, G series lenses as well, like the 10 to 25, the ability to be electronically parfocal. So this does this doesn't mean that we are a hundred percent like mechanically parfocal. It means that we're able to use all of the information that we're gathering through the way the lens is focusing, the positioning of where that element is. Uh, in relation to the focal length and the, the, so the zoom range that you're at. And as you zoom, we're able to make the micro adjustments needed because of how accurate those linear motors are to still maintain your focus point as you zoom through the range. So this means that while they're not mechanically parfocal, you're still getting the parfocal effect so that you know that you can make a focus zoom and still have everything actually be in focus. So it's a big jump up that you, again, you typically are never finding in photo oriented lenses, especially lenses that are pretty much within about the same price range across the board when you're looking at, you know, optics like our 5114 or our 70 to 200 or even our 70 200 F4. So this gives a huge, huge thing to, to basically just push forward. And so basically, if, if you want to read more about how that kind of stuff works, um, I dropped the link for this uh, particular case study that was written by Matt Frazier in the chat. So I encourage you guys to go take a look at that uh, and, 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 and read up what he's got going on there. Uh, but then we also have a lot of other uh, resources available on our global site that give you guys a much more uh, kind of in-depth look at what what we do for our lenses and the, the kind of logic and direction that we go for to, to create lenses, because ultimately you could have the best camera in the world, but if you've got a kind of subpar lens, you're not taking the best advantage of what that camera can do. So things from resolving power to focusing speeds to accuracy in its focusing speeds, uh, even things as much as the color contrast that the lenses create. And again, someone mentioned in here about, you know, color. When you look at, say, like the uh, Leica series lenses having a different kind of color to them or a different look. A lot of that can come down to things as simple as when you start looking at the different coatings that are being put on lenses. Uh, different lenses will have different uh, kind of targets for what you're looking for uh, as far as characteristics of that lens. So... Back in the day, it was, you know, you had uncoated lenses, and even today, you have a lot of cinema lenses that are now being branded as uncoated because you get a very specific look, you know, different flaring, different ghosting effects, things like that. And in some cases, those can actually be fairly desirable. But with modern uh, lenses, it's all about just the way you're handling the light that comes into the lens to hit the sensor, which can affect the way the color is reproduced. So depending on the camera lens that you're looking at, whether it's a Leica series lens, uh, whether it's a Lumix S series lens or a standard G series or what we call as our X series lenses, like the 12 to 35, 35 to 100, they have different kind of targets that are designed for what the color rendition is going to be. Uh, this can be really, uh, this can be really easily controlled uh, when you use something like a uh, color calibration chart, uh, because you can create color profiles that take the lens, uh, 
the lens color out of the different choices that you have. But one of the things that I encourage everyone to take a look at is, is read up on how much time when someone's preparing to shoot, say, a feature film. Lens choice becomes a huge part of pre-production because you'll be looking and saying like, okay, I want to have this particular look or uh, I think one of the most uh, famous ones was Star Wars. The original lenses that were used to shoot um, the original series, so episode one, uh, episode uh, <laughs> four, five, and six, uh, the original actual lenses that were used for that were found to shoot the later series. Uh, not all of them, but some of the, the later series. And that was because very specifically they were looking for that look. You wanted it to match color-wise, contrast-wise, as, as close as possible to the original series. Uh, and obviously the technologies change behind those lenses, but you're looking at lenses from you know, the, the 70s that were put on modern cameras that were shooting you know, within the last 10 years, and they're still performing beautifully on those cameras. Uh, so when we look at, you know, some of the other things that Panasonic does to create, you know, these ultra high quality lenses and the attention to detail that we're providing, there's a lot about, you know, how the optics are actually performing from edge to edge. And I know that that's something that a lot of people probably say, you know, this is, this is like the same for everybody. Everyone wants, you know, ultra corner sharpness and things like that. But we go a step further in a lot of cases like that. Uh, and I don't have a particular slide of it, but um, what I wanted to show is, so on this 50 millimeter, so this is the, the 50 millimeter 1.4 S Pro. The aspheric element that's used in this lens is the largest photographic aspheric element that is deployed, as far as I have been made aware, that is the largest aspheric element that's been designed and deployed in a photographic lens to date. Um, now that was 100% true as of the day that we announced this lens. I honestly have not followed up close enough. So take that with an asterisk if you find another lens that's using something bigger. But the reason why that's important is that our attention to detail for image quality when it comes to the lenses even goes down into how the aspheric elements are created. Aspheric elements are typically molded glass because they're very complex in design. And what happens with that is that you typically get onion ringing effect or that onion skin effect in the bokeh balls. Or you get that kind of that halo around the bokeh ball. So you go from like really dark to really bright to really dark again. And our optics engineers went to the extra step to say, well, with those molds, we need to polish the molds so that you're not getting the that onion skinning imprint onto the glass. So your bokeh looks much more pleasing since we live in a world where everyone wants to shoot, or vast majority, I don't want to generalize for everybody, but a lot of people want to shoot in ultra shallow depth of field and just show as much bokeh as you can and get those giant bokeh balls in the back. Having that as something that won't become distracting because you see onion skinning effect in the middle of it it is a major part of the image quality. So a lens like this, a lens like our 70 to 200, even a lens like our 85 millimeter 1.8 are all designed. And actually even to that point, our 70 to 300 that's designed in a way that does this without an aspheric element, um, allows basically to get the best image quality that you can possibly get with modern manufacturing techniques and bring it to that next level. Is everybody going to ever notice some of this stuff? Maybe not. But that's the dedication that our, our optics engineers take into developing these lenses. And we have the backing of the history of working with companies like Leica. Now, Sigma being in the Elmat Alliance, you have all of these different, you know, kind of behemoths of the optics engineering world creating these, you know, stunning results for truthfully, for the vast majority of people like you and me that will sit and pixel peep images or will look and say like, okay, I don't like this lens because it's got maybe a little bit more of a green cast to it versus this lens that's maybe a little more magenta, which then, you know, the cameras kind of impart some on that as well. So there's, there's so much about the actual build and, and setup of these lenses. 
Let me address a couple of questions before I, I go to the last part, because uh, we're coming up on 2 o'clock already. Um, where was it? Redbit's asking, I see that Leica added linear MF to their lenses. Are they compatible with Lumix S linear manual focus? Uh, that I honestly have no clue. I have not had the ability to test and work with any of those, uh, the new lenses. Um, I have a feeling that it's not mainly because that would involve full understanding of the competitor's lenses. Because one of the things you have to remember is that even though we are in alliance together, uh, all three companies are still competitors. Um, they're, we're, we're coalesced around a mount and a specification, uh, so a lot of stuff does get uh, built into the standard. Uh, if that is something that's in the standard, then it's possible. Uh, but I, I can take a look and check with uh, some of my friends over at uh, at Leica uh, and see if that's um, if that's something that they know or if that they've tested. Uh, let's see here. Another question. Uh, Pink Floyd DSOTM is the Dark Side of the Moon is the best Pink Floyd LP. Did I show something that had Pink Floyd on it? I mean, I love Pink Floyd, but okay. <laughs> uh, let's hear. Uh, can linear motors be controlled electronically to adjust focus speed such as slow, fast, ease in, and etc.? cetera? Uh, yes and no. Uh, when you start looking at uh, cameras like the S1H or the GH5, uh, for that matter, uh, we do have the ability to control um, focus transitions through this. Uh, and I did talk about that in one of the previous uh, Lumix live sessions, as I'm, t again, talking away from the, the lens, <laughs> lens, as I'm talking away from the, uh, the screen here. Uh, I can't get in here. There we go. So um, we do have the ability to do what's called focus transition, uh, which, as you can see here, uh, focus transition is found in the uh, operations menu here on the S1H. And what this allows us to do is go in and say, I want to set my uh, focus poles and say, I want focus pole point number one. I want to have this say here on the live streaming. I want to go into two and I want to have this zoom out to say my portal or aperture science uh, screen here. For those that have seen a lot of stuff, I love Portal and Aperture Science, so I have a lot of this stuff around. Not a crazy amount, but... Um, so I've got both of my focus points uh, set in here. And what I'm able to do with this is then be able to come in here and say, okay, I want my focus transition speed to be low. And then when I go in, so I want to do... I want to turn this off. When I go to start, on the back of the camera, let me move my camera... I get three different choices. So I can say, I want to move to position two, which is back on the aperture science uh, sign. Then I want to move to position one and I want to have it do a rack focus and have it very consistent. So it's very well controlled. Then I can jump back, change this here, go back to the other uh, range here. But the cool part is, is that I can go right in here and I can change that transition speed to say super high. So I want to be able to do a repeatable focus throw. Now I can do move to point one, move to point two, and, I, and know that all I have to do is just tap which position I want to have the camera move to, and I've got my focus, uh, my focus transitions or my focus throws pre-programmed in. Uh, let's see here. Uh, other question here is from Jake. Are the 24 to 105 and 20 to 60 millimeter Lumix S lenses an example of a lens that uses a linear motor and is parfocal, or are those characteristics only for your pro line? Uh, no, those characteristics are for the most part found in every of uh, every one of the Lumix S series lenses that uh, we've released, whether it's an S Pro or an our standard S series lens. The things that you'll see slightly different between an S Pro and a standard S lens is maybe the tolerance of focus breathing. Longer telephoto lenses are typically much harder to manage focus breathing with. Though if you look at something like our 70 to 300, the new lens that we did release and have shipped, uh, and I, I, I do know that there's a lot of people here in the US still waiting for their lenses. Um, I can tell you the demand has been overwhelming for it. So just 
a little more patience and and uh, they it'll be out. Uh, but it is definitely shipping. Um, lenses like the 70 to 300, which is a standard Lumix S series lens at 300 millimeter is basically has no focus breathing. Uh, so it, it still is designed to that same standard. Um, the only lens that I know in the S series lineup that doesn't use, um, solely linear focus motors is, I believe the 50 millimeter because the 50 millimeter uses a mix of both. Um, and a lot of that's down to just how big of an element that you're moving around uh, in this lens. Uh, the 70 to 2028, I believe, does use just uh, linear motors, but I can check on that as well. Um, so yeah, there's not really a, a difference going that way between them. It's a lot of character, sharpness, and tolerance that you see uh, for, for that kind of level uh, between the S Pro and the S Standard lenses. JC's asking, do you make an L mount to micro four thirds lens adapter? Uh, no, we do not. Um, truthfully, I do not know if it's even possible. Uh, the flange focal distance between an L mount, uh, and the micro four thirds mount is something like point. It's either 0.75 or 0.5 millimeters. So you'd have to be able to pack all of the electronics and the physical mount converter and have it strong enough to actually hold all of that stuff together. Uh, so I do not know if that is something that is possible, but we've always brought this up to our team in Japan. Uh, Red Production says, uh, does it have any new firmware update for the S series? Um, we did just release the huge uh, plethora of firmware updates for the S series. So if you take a look at the, um, uh, you can either just Google Lumix uh, firmware update, or actually I can just drop this here. Um, uh, we did just release a whole bunch of firmware updates for the S-series cameras that we have available online right now. Uh, there were some recent updates for G-series as well. Uh, so there's a link to the firmware update. Uh, and then Keith is asking, can the new 70-300 to be used with a 1.4 or 2x teleconverter? Uh, no, it can't. Uh, teleconverters have to be, uh, can only work on lenses that have a, an inset rear element. Uh, 70 to 300 does not, uh, and typically lenses that are slower aperture, you're usually not going to see teleconverters on, uh, mainly just because you end up dumping your aperture so low, um, because you're working with a variable aperture lens. Uh, so yeah, un unfortunately the 70 to 300 does not support teleconverters. Um, okay. The last, the ultimate last thing before I'm going to call this week's stream here is the last kind of core piece of technology that we've got in the S series cameras, and that is the ability to actually control, uh, what I would argue is probably the, uh, probably one of the most, uh, commonly referred to points about modern mirrorless lenses. And that's the fact that they use focus by wire, uh, focus by wire is basically where you're taking the lens and instead of having, and actually let me switch back to this one. So instead of having a uh, physical coupling between the ring here and the actual element, there's electronical, or electronical, there's electrical contacts between the ring and the uh, assembly that moves the, uh, the focusing system. With modern, uh, link didn't work. Let me check on that while I'm doing this. Uh, eh, link, link should work. Um, there you go. Uh, so with, with modern lenses, they're typically being built with uh, focus by wire or the electronic controlled focus. What this typically runs into, um, what, what this typically causes is the variable speed of however fast you turn the lens can change how much of a distance the lens actually changes its distance or tells the lens to focus. So this becomes a, a frustrating thing for a lot of filmmakers and even photographers. As a photographer myself, that annoys the heck out of me uh, when I have a lens that doesn't allow me to have at least some control over the focus throw distance that I'm going to be using. So what we built into the S-series cameras is the ability to change the focus ring control. So in the menu, you'll be able to come in here and say, I wanna change this. By default, these lenses are gonna be designed for non-linear. This means that the rotation speed of the ring will change how far and how fast your focus will change from near to far or far to near. 
But we went a step further and we added, okay, well, we can do linear because we have the information, the positional information in some lenses that allows us to say this distance from this distance on a rotation with this, with the focus ring means X distance in the focus movement that you want to make. So that was cool. We launched that. Everything's hunky dory. But we went even one step further because, again, that cinema design and that, that logic that we have about how we're designing these lenses went in to say, well, but what about how far you want to throw this lens? Not physically throw the lens, that would be stupid, but how far do you want to have the ring rotate to go from near to far focus? So with that is where we added in under the set menu is to actually change the degrees that it takes to move from near to far focus. So by default, the cameras are typically set to 150 degrees. So that means you rotate this 150 degrees and you'd go from your closest focus to your furthest out. For macro shooters, you can go all the way into 360 degrees so that you've got that ultra fine level of control. And then when you go all the way down to say 90 degrees, it's a much more coarse focusing choice, but it means that for every degree you move, the jump from one point to point number two to point number three that's divided out for however long that focal range goes changes how, um, you know, how much you're going to be able to move this. So for, say, portrait photographers where, you know, maybe not necessarily studio portrait photographers, but street photographers may much prefer to have 90 degree throw. Because I know, you know, that I can move my point over here, I can move it back here, and I know exactly where I'm going. Or, with a 50mm lens like this, I can just put it into that manual in the clutch and know that I've got point A, point B, and I know how far my distance is. But if I'm a cinema shooter, I can set it to be 360 degree or 270 degree because I know that I want a very steady, slow push for how I want this to go. And I know that I want to be able to do this in a very, you know, kind of smooth rack uh, design. Uh, and then for those macro shooters where, you know, you're going to be way up close and every kind of, you know, millimeter counts as you're, you're focusing, you can set it to 360 and you know that you have near infinite control over how many steps that focus motor goes uh, throughout the range. So the, these are huge, huge benefits with using our lenses over uh, some of the others that are designed in the market. Now, when we look at some of the setups that you see from the rest of the industry, so like, again, this is my 24 millimeter uh, 1.4 Sigma lens. That's the uh, L-mount converted version. This has a manually affixed focus ring. So that means that no matter what, it's going to be measured onto the scale with those kind of soft, hard stops, so you can hear it. Actually, you might not be able to hear that because I use NVIDIA Broadcaster for noise reduction. So maybe that maybe you didn't hear anything. Maybe you just saw me doing something stupid with a lens. Uh, but basically, you have the same effective functionality of what a mechanically coupled focusing system does on a lens, just in a more modern chassis that allows a more granular control over how that focusing system works. All right, let's see what we got. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions here before I have to actually end today. Uh, let's see here. Okay, FC heard it. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, all right, Keith. Uh, all right, link work for you. Um, Hopefully for a future update that will allow S-Series users to use APS-C crop in photo mode manually. I would love to see it. I know I've brought it up with a couple of our team uh, as well. Um, we'll we'll bring it up again. Um, and again, because you guys comment that kind of stuff in here, we see it, and it gets uh, our team in Japan sees it as well. Uh, Rec Production saying, I was testing the latest firmware update. Sigma 18 to 35, usable, uh, unusable in 6K. May I know why? Uh, that's because the 16 to, uh, the 18 to 35 Sigma lens is an APS-C designed lens. So using it on, uh, I assume you have an MC30, uh, MC, MC21 adapter. 31 is the PL adapter. Uh, if you're using something like an MC21 or another smart adapter, it's communicating to the camera that that's an APS-C lens. Uh, the 18 to 35, I know a lot of people have done some tests 
and say that at certain focal lengths, it kind of covers full frame. Uh, but one, you're using areas of the lens that aren't designed for image capture. Uh, so you run into typically a lot softer corners and things like that. And two, uh, it just isn't designed to cover a full 35 millimeter sensor area. And 6K recording uh, on these cameras, when you actually, like on an S1H, when you actually set it in 6K, uh, it is using the full 35 millimeter sensor. So you would have some pretty severe vignetting on it. Uh, so that's why it's not working there. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Cool. So the last thing I want to do here is where did my link go? I know I saved the link here. Yeah, I'll just do it this way. It's just a lot easier. So uh, as we mentioned before, we have the uh, an event coming up on Tuesday uh, to talk about um, some exciting new stuff. So I encourage everybody to let me just get the link here and drop this in the chat so everyone can see it. Uh, I encourage everybody to join us on uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, you can watch at the link below. Uh, that's also a link that you can use to um, get yourself on the email list so that uh, if you want to be first to know about new products and things like that that are coming out, uh, you can get yourself up on that list as well. Uh, Weekend Visual says, I know it's on Sigma's plate, but will AFC can happen on MC21? That's totally on Sigma's plate. Sorry, <laughs> can't answer that one. Um, so, uh, all right, well, uh, we got a couple more questions here. Uh, what are the differences between your S primes versus your S pro primes for video? Not a huge difference uh, between them, truthfully. Uh, in what is currently available, uh, the biggest difference that you're going to see is probably the focus breathing uh, characteristic differences. While the S85 uh, millimeter 1.8 is uh, very well controlled for focus breathing by comparison to the rest of the industry, um, the S Pro series lenses are going to be more controlled uh, for focus breathing, typically. Uh, outside of that, you're looking at a lot of things just like the color and rendering. Um, so that's kind of what the major differences are. Okay. Uh, so yes, um, as I was saying before, at the link that I just dropped in the chat here, uh, on Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, uh, we have an announcement coming. So you're definitely going to want to uh, take a look Get yourself subscribed uh, to this channel that you're on right now uh, so that you guys can actually take part and join uh, what's going on. Um, I'll be there. Uh, I think Matt Frazier will be there as well, too. So uh, be sure to definitely, you know, come by and join us on Tuesday at 10 a.m. It's a little bit of a different time than normal, but you're not going to want to miss it. Um, outside of that. Uh, we will be live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I will have a link available for that as soon as I can. Um, FC's asking, uh, will it be on this YouTube channel on Tuesday? Yes. Yep. It's on the Lumix USA channel. So you want to get subscribed uh, to this channel if you're not already. Um, I'm going to pull the, the, the YouTuber thing right now. 40% of you are not subscribed. It would be awesome if you did subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. Um Follow us and see what you can do there. So that's my uh, shameless plug. Uh, Cliff's asking, will Panasonic be at NAB in October? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Um, I think we are. Uh, I'm just not sure. Uh, with the way with the way travel and everything is with uh, the U.S., um, a lot of that can dictate whether or not uh, staff goes out. Um, obviously, things change, and we're on a much better path than we were a couple months ago. Uh, so I'm hopeful, uh, but I do believe we'll be at NAB. Um, hopefully I don't get yelled at for saying that. I don't, I don't know, but I would assume we're going to be, we've been at NAB every, every other year. So except last year, because of obviously NAB being canceled. All right. With that, again, I want to remind everybody about that Lumix Pro Services platform that we have, the red tier for free, which everyone should be going over to take a look at and see, uh, and get yourself registered for it. If you're not in the U.S., uh, we do have Lumix Pro Services uh, online. Just do a quick Google search, Lumix Pro Services, uh, and you'll be able to see what's available in your region. Uh, in the U.S., we have the red tier, which is free, the platinum tier, which is our, uh, you know, our, our top tier version of it. 
Uh, and this uh, basically gives you all those different benefits from the free series, which gets you a three-year warranty, to the paid tier, which gets you exclusive member phone line, 20% off out of warranties, two-day repair turnaround, uh, annual sensor cleanings, all that kind of fun stuff, as well as a really sick strap um, that, uh, personally, I've always been a fan of the Peak Design straps, and I was so stoked when we got them to partner with us on those kits. So, outside of that... Um, thank you everyone for, for sticking around with me for the last hour and uh, hour and 15 minutes. I appreciate it. And, uh, I'll see you all next, uh, I'll probably see you on Tuesday. Remember go over, like subscribe. I got the link in the uh, chat there for you. Talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.